All right, the book of Daniel, we're still, we're still in that chapter 4. And we are studying the message from God to Nebuchadnezzar through this servant, Daniel. And he says in verse 27, Wherefore, O king, let not my counsel, let my counsel be accepted unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor that if there may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Now, this is a call to repentance. This is a call to repentance. Um, and I think we began to look at how God moves even among these nations. Thy sins, break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquities. And so we have words of wisdom being spoken in the street. The idea is redeem now your sins. And we had an example of Simon Peter. Uh, and um, I mean Philip and Simon Peter and Simon in the book of Acts 8. I think we showed that. And then showing mercy to the poor. It sounds like as if uh, Daniel's reading the law to Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, if this was said to Israel, we go, uh-huh, yeah, that's what they're supposed to do. But this is being said to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, this Chaldean king. Um, and uh, God's law doesn't change, and we need to look at this and what this means. Uh, look in the book of Isaiah 58. The book of Isaiah, chapter 58. Isaiah 58, verse 12. I'm sorry. Isaiah, yes. Isaiah 58, verse 8 through 12. Isaiah 58, 8. Then shall thy light break forth like the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear guard. Then thou shalt... Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here am I. Here I am. If thou, if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be like the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, satisfy thy soul in drought, make, make fat thy bones. And thou shalt uh, be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the, raise up the fountains of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the path to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. That's, that's what it would look like. That's what God, the Lord, wants for all men. But especially for his people. But remember, the remnant is in this king's court. <laughs> you got you to look at this how God sees it. The remnant of Israel, the believing remnant that represents faith in the Lord is in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar did that, he might not have realized it, but he invited God into his court. His chosen are there. His word is there. 
So we, we see that principally move forward. Look in the book of Jonah, chapter 3, for just a moment. The book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Let's look in chapter 3 for just a moment, please. Jonah. Uh, Nineveh repents. <laughs> uh, now this is a funny missionary, Jonah. Um, he was uh, he gave the gospel in in a mind of vengeance. He wanted God to let these uh, guys have it. See, uh, if you can imagine doing the ministry as if you're working the ministry to set up for the kill. That's what Jonah was doing. Uh, God's going to call him to repentance. Uh, these son of a guns aren't going to repent at all. And I'm going to stand there and watch God take them out. That was Jonah's idea. Really, it was. And that's why he runs to his juniper tree. And God lets him, God lets him vent and grumble over there. And then he sends a worm and takes out the juniper tree. Enough of that. Okay. So Jonah... Chapter 3, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now imagine this is a Jew going into Nineveh. Now these Ninevites were right above where Jonah lived, and they came down all the time and sacked and pillaged and just persecuted these people. Okay. Um, and Jonah arose, went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. Take you three days to walk through it. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And he couldn't wait. <laughs> That's just terrible. All right. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. They repented, lo and behold. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Mm -hmm. The king did this of Nineveh at the word of Jonah, a Hebrew. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, Taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that's in their hands. You know, Pharaoh would have done that back there with Moses. He'd have been a lot better off. But he, he didn't. He hardened his heart. All right, now notice. Who can tell if God will turn? Repent and turn away this fierce anger, and we perish not. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Uh, Nineveh showed repentance. Okay. The commission of the, of the Lord as sent to do the same. Look in the book of Isaiah now, chapter 63. Isaiah, chapter 63. Did I say Isaiah 63? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. 
1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto those who mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, oil for joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness. That's where those come from, by the way. The planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. All right, now let's compare that, if you will, to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, uh, our Lord gives a translation of this concerning himself and the ministry that God had sent him to do. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Let's look in verse 18. Uh, Jesus has entered Nazareth, hometown. He's entered the synagogue. And they've, uh, as they would do in the synagogue, um, the book was delivered to him. And he opened the book to that very phrase, very, pa uh, very passage. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. All right. Um, if you notice, um, to preach the gospel to who? The poor. And God is giving um, Nebuchadnezzar this prerequisite to repentance. Now, what does that take? Well, we've discussed this. He's going to have to humble himself. And I don't think Nebuchadnezzar's quite there. Okay, I don't think he's quite there. I think God's going to have to hew down the tree. And, and send him out in the field to graze like a beast to bring him around to that. Um, but nonetheless, that's, uh, that's, what this is, um, that's what this is saying. So now the promise. The lengthening of thy tranquility. Um, that's what in every king wants. And every national leader wants is peace. Right? <laughs> peace. And um, what we want to look at, even in the case of Ahab, um, look with me, if you will, in the book of First Kings, chapter 21. I think it's what I want. isn't making sense. We better stop off at 2 Kings 21. I think we might have a little better success there. We have um, Manasseh uh, who's given to us here. Let me see in 1 Kings 21 too. It might be just an error on my part. Who knows? All right. No, I stand corrected. I do want 1 Kings 21 first. Ahab. Let's look at Ahab. 1 Kings chapter 21 and in verse 17. You remember. Ahab marries Jezebel and in comes the prophets of Baal. Uh, he's brought this prophetess. Je Jezebel was a prophetess of Baal. And uh, he takes her as his wife. And Israel is turned over to Balaam. Now, in verse 17 of 1 Kings 21, 
And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of Naboth, where he's gone down to possess it. Think God doesn't see what's going on? He knows right where Ahab is. He knows exactly what's happened and whose garden it is. Okay? Thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood even thine. Uh, that's kind of a Nathan to David thing. Thou art the man. Think I didn't see that, Ahab? Notice he, he's not talking about Jezebel, really the one that executed it. He goes to who? Ahab. He holds Ahab responsible for the blood of Naboth, doesn't he? Uh, just as God held Cain responsible for the blood of Abel, right? All right, now notice. And Ahab said to, to, to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. You sold out for Naboth's garden. Remember Ahab won the Naboth's garden he couldn't get. He went in and pouted, laid down on his bed with his face toward the wall. And, and uh, Jezebel wasn't going to have that. Now, Jezebel didn't understand the inheritance of God to his people. That land didn't belong to any king or Jezebel for sure. It didn't even belong to Naboth. It belonged to God. God gave the inheritance as they were following him. Now, notice. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and take away the posterity and will cut off from Ahab every male and to him who is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the pro provocation with which thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. He starts with Ahab. God started with Adam in the garden, didn't he? Okay. And of Jezebel also spoke the word of the Lord, saying, Dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. I got plans. <laughs> I got plans for you two. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. This is gruesome, isn't it? But there was none like it unto Ahab who did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight. Is that the compliment you want in Scripture? Nobody like Ahab sold out in wickedness. Whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. This man has went backwards. He's brought back the gods that God threw out. <laughs> and it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes, put sackcloth upon his flesh, fasted, and laid in sackcloth, and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. Now, this is pretty heavy, nasty stuff here, isn't it? Naboth's garden, um, the worship of Ashtaroth, uh, bringing in the prophets of Baal, 
um, the blood that was shed concerning the in promised inheritance. These are pretty heavy charges, right? Nobody sells out like Ahab. Sounds like a country western song, don't it? <laughs> now, nobody can sell out the wickedness like Ahab. You want to know how to do that? Go look at Ahab, <laughs> I guess. All right. But notice when Ahab truly, sincerely repents and humbles himself before God. See that? Now God's going to judge sin. It's a coming. That's what's going to happen. During the tribulation, God's going to judge sin. Mm -hmm. Understand that. He's a holy, same holy God as always. And sin's going to be judged. Whether it's his own people or the nations, God judges sin. The wages of sin is death. Period. It doesn't matter who it is. Now, he may wait to do it. He may be long-suffering, but it's coming. It's coming. All right, now let's look to, in 2 Kings chapter 20. Now you see my dilemma. 2 Kings chapter 21. This book of 2 Kings chapter 21. You remember why they're in this uh, dilemma in the first place, don't you? Give us a king so we can be like all the other nations. <laughs> Boy, did they do a good job of that. Yeah. Um, this king has it all over Ahab almost, if that's possible. Uh, look in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 21. Um There was a revival by Hezekiah, and this wicked king overthrows the revival. You can imagine that. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem, will I put my name, verse 4, verse 5, 21. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He brought in idolatry. He brought in demon worship into the house of the Lord, in the courts of the Lord's house. Is that like asking for it or what? Mm -hmm. All right, so look in verse 10. And the Lord spoke by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abomin abominations, and hath done wickedly above all the Amorites did, who were before him, and hath Judah also to sin and in his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth it, both of his ears shall tangle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I'm going to wipe them out. Won't even know they were there. I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. If you think the provocation was something, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what that means. Okay, we get more of what Manasseh did in Ammon in Judah, and it just gets worse and worse, and then they start assassinating these guys. And then comes along Josiah. And in comes another revival. Now look in 2 Kings 22, verse 8. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said unto Chaphon, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Chaphon, and he read it. And Chaphon, the scribe, came 
the, to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servant have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work and have oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphon, the scribe, showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered to me a book, and Shaphon read it before the king. And God stays this judgment that he was ready to, to, to give because of Manasseh, because of Josiah, turning Israel back to him. Now later, he brings that judgment. Okay? All right, we, you should read these chapters. I can't read them all. We'll never get anywhere. But it's important that we appreciate this. Okay, now, what we need to appreciate, which I'm not, still not getting to, <laughs> is repentance. Repentance. Repentance is a change of heart and mind. It's a change of heart and mind. It is not a separate step of salvation. So please be careful when someone preaches it that way. It is impossible for an unbeliever to repent on his own. If you read the book of Romans chapter 3 and you believe in the total depravity of man, you're going to come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Repentance is certainly in the process of belief. Where we're convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment, as John 16 tells us. It is a, a thorough change. It is certainly also an evidence of salvation. Now, when someone hardens their heart concerning repentance, we have a case for doubt. Paul said, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Okay? Uh, when God comes and convicts, there must be then a... Uh, a heart that is turned. Now, can these um, Gentiles be used in God's program? Uh, we have a good example of that in the book of Acts, chapter 10. You'll see that Cornelius follows this prescription to the letter. Look in Acts chapter 10. book of Acts chapter 10 and let's look in verses 1 and 2 and then 23 through 33 which we're not going to have time for this morning but notice there was a certain man verse 1 Acts 10 10 1 of Acts there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of the band called the Italian band a devout man and one that was feared God with all his house who gave much alms to the people or the poor and prayed to God always. Well, here's a Gentile of the Gentiles. Remember Paul said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews? Well, Cornelius is a Gentile of the Gentiles. <laughs> you don't get any more Gentile than this guy. Okay? Uh, and, and look, if you will, in verse... Um, Oh, let's look over here in verse uh, 19. Uh, God's got changes a coming, and Peter's going to have to go into the house of a Gentile. And notice verse 19, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. This is my program. Don't tell me not so, Lord, again. Remember God had those animals in the sheet? Peter, arise and eat. Oh, no, not so, Lord. <laughs> no, 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 Peter. Hold on a minute. Now, this is my program. Then Peter went down to the men who were sent unto him from, from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. 
what is the cause for which ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a what? Just man. And one that feareth God. And of good report among all the nation of the Jews was warned from God by the holy angel to send for thee into his house and hear words of thee. Now, I can't imagine, maybe a, just your Gentile citizen gets away with this, but imagine you're a centurion in the Roman army from Italy. Okay? In Caesarea. And you're going to the synagogue and you're following the law and you're fearing God and that could be a little dangerous for him to do. And then to have this apostle from Jerusalem to come into his house and preach the gospel. Right? But you see how God is able to work in men's, in men's hearts and lives. Who would think that Saul of Tarsus would become the apostle Paul? No, Ananias, you go. I've got things I'm going to do with this guy. He's going to spread the gospel all over the Roman Empire and before kings and, for my, for, and suffer for my name's sake. Go get Saul of Tarsus. Bring him here. Now, we'll look at this uh, in, in greater detail next week. Um, understand that regeneration is the operation of God by the Holy Spirit, life from above. Repentance is the change of heart and mind in the process of the conviction of sin. These things work together in the process of salvation. Okay? Okay. All right, let's turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 